Hello and welcome to Be a Tier, the German Engineer. Explains, oxygen not included. Today we are talking about Pacus as well as Poke Shells, and I have several different builds for you, a bunch of them even off screen right now. So let's just jump right into it and see how that works out for us. And here we are with our Paku setup and this one here is the fully fed version. So let's turn the overlay back on and then let's take a look. First of all, let's see what we have here in power. In power, we have here on the right an auto sweeper and on the left an auto sweeper as well as two different conveyor loaders right here. That is all we need. Everything you see here on the left is completely optional and only for what I'm doing right now. Here on the top, this here is supplying LG to the top right here and here on the bottom we have the Paku fillets coming out as well as the polluted dirt and the eggshells. How you do that in your build now that is of course fully up to you so completely ignore everything that's on the left side right here. In our automation overlay now it's getting slightly more interesting right here we have a critter sensor and this critter sensor is hooked up first to a knot gate and then to the right top door and the left top door and right here in the middle is where we are storing all of our eggs as well as the LG. The eggs are very important because we just let the eggs hatch there is no incubator or anything like that involved and we are determining with the help of this critter sensor if we are putting our freshly hatched pacus into the left side which is a completely starved farm or the right side which is a completely fed farm that is exactly what this here does so we are sending out a signal if we are below eight then this door here will open and this one here will close therefore a freshly hatched paku can only jump over to the right fall down and eventually end up in the water right here or if we are as we are right now above eight then we are sending out a red signal and the red signal opens up this door right here so all of our freshly hatched pakus are hopping over to the left and end up in here and in here we literally just let them starve to death and get some paku fillets out of them that is the entire idea to the right auto sweeper right here we also have a cycle sensor hooked up which is set up to uh, activation time 0% and active duration 30%. This can vary whatever you want to do. It's just to save a little bit of energy. That's literally it. That's the only purpose of this sensor right here. In our shipping overlay, we can see that we have this top conveyor loader here and this top conveyor loader here has only critter eggs turned on. And that is all critter eggs because it does not matter if it is a tropical fry or a gold fry or a normal fry. Everything we get, we just plop it up here. It will be fine. Everything else is turned off for the top one and we can see it is connected to this output here on the top. The bottom one, on the other hand, is turned on with everything except critter eggs. If we go down in the list, we can see also algae is turned off. So algae and critter eggs are the only two things that the bottom one does not take and the reason for that is simple point a we don't want to get the algae out here because when we take it this auto sweeper it can reach this position right here so we would basically just create an endless loop and that is not what we want we of course want to feed our packers and our critter eggs of course same thing we want to have them up here and not over here somewhere so what is this weird looking tank right here and how does it work? Well, if we take a look, one Paku needs a total of eight spaces. We have eight of them in here, so we need a total of 64 spaces. And if we take a look, all these here, including our mesh tiles of spaces, we have 45 right here, plus 16 down here on the bottom, plus a another three here on the top, makes exactly 64. The nice thing about Pacus is that they don't really care. We only have two tiles worth of water down here. Then we have 50 kilograms of polluted water, 50 kilograms of salt water, 50 kilograms of brine, 50 kilograms of petroleum, and 50 kilograms of crude oil. So all of these layers right here basically have no mass at all. It's next to nothing. It's only 50 kilograms per tile instead of like about a thousand. If you have all these materials available, it is of course a lot easier and you can save a lot of them. Or if you have only brine or salt water or polluted water available, but want to conserve your beautiful water, you can certainly do that. It makes no difference. And that is the nice thing about it. The Pakus don't care as long as the layer that they are actually in is water that is the important part so we have two layers of water up here and you can see it's a thousand kilograms each but everything below it is nice and empty so let's take a look at a different version of the almost exact same build right here we have a different version and it almost looks the same doesn't it the only difference is that we have one mesh tile right here and our eight pakus and we can see yes it is actually eight are in one singular space and when we click through them we can see all of them or most of them better to say are gloom and when they're gloom their production rate goes down one is even starving but some of them are not 
And if they're not, they are reproducing a lot. We can see that a change per cycle is 67% to lay an egg. So basically what we're doing is this is a half starved farm. The left side is still completely starved and the right side here is half starved. Our fish feeder here is set up to algae and it has a maximum setting of one kilogram, 1000 grams. And at the same time, our cycle sensor is set up to 10% active duration. So it is only active for 10% of the entire cycle. And when it is active, it is only supplying one kilogram at a time, keeping only a couple of those Pakus here actually happy. And that is it. Maybe even one of them. But when we take a look in our room overlay, we can see on the right, we have a room size of eight tiles and we have eight critters in it. And on the left side, we have a room size of nine tiles and 17 critters in it. And all of this was created only by those Pakus here on the right. I did not add any. I didn't do anything to it. We just have a bunch of critters in here while feeding him next to nothing. And the nice thing is also this auto sweeper here on the left reaches this tile right here. So if something dies in here, we can still get the meat out. And do we have some meat in here? Yes, we have 11,000 calories over here. Isn't that nice? Also, you can see we have a goldfish in here. That's what I'm saying. It does not matter. Even if a goldfish is born, we just plop it onto the left side and call it a day. Even if it's on the right, we still don't care. It is fine because at the end of the day, our Pakus will always overwhelm because when we take a look down here on the bottom, fry eggs are at 96% and for the goldfish, it is still 31%. So no matter what, eventually the goldfish will die out and the Pakus will overwhelm them as long as we keep the water temperature in here halfway regulated. So there is something that you may want to do about that in case it is in your own base. But let's take a look at another option. Right here we have the same version again and this time we have only two Pakus in here and therefore we have right here only 14 tiles plus two right here makes a total of 16. Two times eight makes 16 so both Pakus are very happy and still producing two eggs every three cycles. That is awesome. That is what we want to have. Let me take a look up here. We already have what one tropical fry egg and three fry eggs right here and let me take a look into our room overlay not the automation overlay but the room overlay. We can see we also have four critters here and this is one of the last ones that I built. I did not build them all at the same time or put the Pakus in at the same time. So it's not really an apples to apples comparison, but just for your understanding, we are getting a bunch of Pakus in here and it takes next to no time. Also, our fish feeder right here is also set up to one kilogram. And right here, we also have this here set to 20% active duration. The activation time really doesn't matter. When that happens is really none of our concern, as long as the active duration is accurate. And with one kilogram or 20%, those Pakus here are fully fed, fully happy and fully producing, saving us a bunch of algae. And then right here, last but not least, we have the exact same setup once again, only with one Paku. And once again, here we have six tiles plus another two right there. Makes a total of eight tiles. The Paku is happy. He's properly fed. And that is all that matters. He is hungry. Yes, but he is not gloom. And that's what is important. So let's take a look in our room overlay. So we actually know what's going on here. On the left side, we have 15 critters in here. 15 Paku fry. My goodness. Yeah, I bought this one here before I built the other one. And up here on the top, we have another two fry eggs laying around. It's pretty insane how powerful Pakus are. They are giving out so many eggs. It's insane. And also what is important, of course, is the egg shells. With the egg shells, we can make a lime. And that is probably the number one thing you will get out of them. Something like this here can be built in your normal water reservoir. For example, the one Paku version is always nice to have because if the Paku dies, you will have a downturn really, really quickly. But at the same time, as soon as the next one is born, it is fine. Your critter sensor, of course, has to be set to the appropriate amount of Pakus that is very very important. So let's take a look at the poke shells. Before we take a look at our poke shells, I want to show you this tank here. It is quite insane. The beauty of this game amazes me every time again. So if I turn up the speed to full force and run the game, look at those insane patterns. I don't know, something about it is mesmerizing to me and I figured I would share it with you. But now let's actually take a look at our poke shells. And right here we have our poke shell farm. So let's take a look at that. First of all, everything that's on the right of this nomadic door here is not needed. That is only for old Harold right here. Harold is making sure that our critters here are happy. But other than that, these here are just his living quarters. You don't need any sort of sink or lavatory or comfy bed for obvious reasons. All this here can go if you don't have a single Harold taking care of it, which will probably be the case if we are very honest. Also right here, this is where the polluted dirt comes in because our poke shells are eating polluted dirt. And down here, I'm storing the polluted water coming out of the 
lavatory. And then of course I need to supply the sink as well as the lavatory with water and of course the entire area here with oxygen. And right beside it the depth generator is for power. Everything else on the left side here that's what we are about to talk about. So let's take a look. First of all, the power overview. We have right here on the right two incubators that are here to hatch our poke shells a little bit faster. Then we come over here and we have three auto sweepers total. One right here on the right, one on the bottom middle and one on the top left. Those are our three auto sweepers and each and every one of them has their function. And we are about to look at that in a second. Then over here on the left, we have a conveyor loader and right beside the right auto sweeper, we have another conveyor loader. And right here, we have a deodorizer. And that is it. That's all that's needed. We can take a look here. A total potential load of 1085 watts, even though 480 of those watts are basically never used, only about 10% of the cycle. If we then take a look into our conveyor overlay, we can see a couple things. First of all, from the right here, we have a conveyor rail coming in with polluted dirt and the polluted dirt is right here hooked up to a conveyor chute, which is what is feeding our poke shells right here on the top. Then on the left side here, we have a conveyor loader and the conveyor loader is set up to only critter eggs and all of them because it does not matter. Everything that we get out of those poke shells, we're going to grab transfer it to the top all the way over into the conveyor chute and drop it right here. Then right here we have another conveyor loader and this conveyor loader here is set up to everything except critter eggs and let's take a look further down here on the bottom polluted dirt. Of course we do not want to remove the food as soon as it comes in because well we want our poke shells to eat that food but everything else that our auto sweepers can grab slap it in there it'll be fine. So what do our auto sweepers actually do? This auto sweeper here on the bottom is solely to get any eggs out of here. If one of those things here should put out an egg, we are ready to go. We grab it and we put it into the conveyor loader. That's its sole purpose in life. This one here on the top does basically the same thing. If these here on the top lay any eggs, which they do a lot when we take a look at our oak shell right here, they have a 17% change per cycle in reproduction. So about 17% per cycle are gained towards laying an egg and they live a total of 100 cycles. So we are going to get quite a lot of eggs out of those things which is very nice and all those eggs are being transferred into this conveyor loader and plopped down here as mentioned earlier. Back up here, when we take a look into our room overlay, we can see we have a total of 10 critters in here that are literally just waiting to starve to death. Isn't that nice? Also, this here can't be left open because this here, for example, is absolutely not needed. If I go to buildings and I open it up just like this, that here is perfectly fine. The only thing is, if I do this here, then I cannot show you the room overlay because it will count everything in the reach. So let's take another look. We were just at 10. Now we are at 57, which of course is not quite right. Therefore, I closed it off just to show you guys how many are actually in here. So let's move to the slightly smaller version of this build. So let's take a look at automation. In the automation overlay, we can see we have a timer sensor right here and the timer sensor is set to green duration 20 and red duration 100, which means we have, well, a green duration of 20 seconds followed by a 100 second long red duration and then back to green. 20 green, 100 red, back and forth and back and forth. And it is connected to our conveyor chute right here just to make sure we don't plop down a literal ton of polluted dirt on the floor. We only want it for 20 seconds every 100 seconds, which is more than enough to feed our eight poke shells right here. But at the same time, we don't have a huge pile sitting right there. And then right here we have a critter sensor and this critter sensor right here is set up to above zero. Yes, right here we have it above zero and it is hooked up to this nomadic door right here, the top one not the bottom one. And how this here works, we will take a look at in a second. It is quite an interesting mechanic. You may be surprised of how simple it is. And then at the same time, of course, we have the cycle sensor right here. And the cycle sensor right here is set up to an active duration of 15% with an activation time of 20%. And the activation time is just fitted to Herald schedule. When you set it up, it does not matter if I put it right here. It'll work just as fine as long as the active duration is 15% to give our dupe more than enough time to hug both eggs and help us with hatching them. So this here is how this entire thing works. It's pretty simple and straightforward, but I want to show you one more build and then we will also take a look how this here works. And right here we have the smaller version and it works with only two poke shells instead of eight. It works of course a little bit slower, you will have a little bit less output, but you also save on a lot of polluted dirt. And that's what this build here is all about. So let's take a look. 
First of all, this entire size here is shrunk down. And what I didn't mention before is one poke shale needs a total of eight spaces to be happy. So when we take a look into here, those are 20, which is already more than 16. But at the same time, I want to keep the bottom here alive so we can take care with the auto sweeper. It's just connected so that I have more than enough room. The other room that we just looked at is, of course, exactly eight times eight tiles in size just to fit exactly what we need, not more and not less. And that's where this weird kind of looking design is coming from. Let's take a quick look. How many do we have down here? Just out of pure curiosity. And we have only four, but it's already double the amount than the two that we have up here. And right here, we have two more pinch row eggs. And right here, we have also two. And right here, this one here is incubating at 98%. And as soon as this here is done, we will see how the store here works. So let's wait for that. And here we have it. I just paused it at the right moment. This little guy here has just left his egg. So how does it work? We have right here a critter drop off and this critter drop off is set to a max of eight. It does not matter. It can be set to anything for all I care. But at the same time, it is also set to any one of our poke shells right here. On the left side here, it is also set to poke shells, but with a maximum of two and auto rank of surplus. I did not turn it on and it should be on. The important part is down here on the bottom. This left side here has a higher priority only by one. This one here is at six and this one here is at five and that's all it takes. So if this one here ever falls, falls below the set two, Amari here will come over and put a fresh one in. If it is at two, we will drop it off down here. That's exactly what's about to happen. So let's take a look. Amari has him. Amari lets him go. And we're putting in the next egg right away. And this little guy is now hopping around in here. Our creator sensor says, okay, our current count is one. So we are going to open up our door. But now let's watch. It comes over here, and as soon as it's inside the door, it counts not like it's in the room anymore. The current count is zero, and that is the important part. And when I play the game, the door closes, and this little guy has nowhere else to go, and he will be shoved downwards. And when he is shoved downwards, he is coming into our starving farm, and that's where he is gonna die, unfortunately, a horrible, horrible death. And we can see it when we take a look in the room overlay. Of course, now we have five critters in here. And that's exactly what that should look like. And now I can get rid of this one tile here once again, just like before. And at the bare minimum, they're not confined anymore. That's the best we can do. It is what it is. Also, with this build here, we have a pretty nice output of all sorts of different stuff. We have small poke shells, six of them, 30 kilograms, a total of 3.38 tons worth of sand, and also nine kilograms worth of eggshells. So it definitely adds up over time. But yes, this is the small version of our poke shell setup. And then at the very end of the episode, I want to show you three more things. First of all, Pakus, how do you actually catch them? Well, you have the fish release right here. That is how you get him where you want him to be. But how do you get him out of there? When you go into food, you can see we have a fish trap right here. And if I plop a couple of those fish traps right here and then grab a dupe and spawn him into here, let's see what happens. Yes, they all come just up here randomly. It could be any one of them and they're being grabbed. And Ari right here is not doing anything. I'm not entirely sure why. Well, because we have not set it to Paku Fry. And now Ari is coming over, picking up the fish trap and releasing our fish to wherever it is supposed to go. This here is, well, not working too well sometimes. Sometimes it is a little bit buggy and you can kind of see it right here. Not every fish is being caught immediately, but that is fine because eventually it will work. And this is how you catch fish and release them to wherever you want to release them to. Speaking of Pakus, we have actually never looked at their database entry. So let's do that right now. Their comfort range is between 0 and 60 degrees Celsius and their livable range is between negative 20 and 80 degrees. And they eat a lot of algae and produce about 70 kilograms worth of polluted dirt if they are fully fed. And 140 kilograms per cycle for eight of our Pakus, that is a lot of algae. And usually you don't have that much available, which is why I personally would usually recommend either the half starved version or a very very small amount of those things that is my recommendation for you and when we go down here you can see you can feed that thing all sorts of stuff but at the end of the day you will barely get anything out of it and you probably don't have that many seeds laying around either 
So it is usually a better idea to just give him all your algae and then starve him to death. That's the general idea here. Down here on the bottom, we can see we have a 96% chance of laying a fry egg and to get a tropical fry egg, or better to say to increase the chance, we need to have their body temperature between 35 and 80 degrees Celsius, which is relatively high. When we look at our water here, it is at 20 and a gulp fry egg is between negative 30 and five. So having it at 20 is the perfect temperature to stay with Pakus and then that's usually what we want. The other two really don't matter that much. And then right here, let's take a look at our poke shells as well. They have a comfortable range of 15 to 70 degrees Celsius and a livable range of negative 30 to 100 degrees Celsius. Those things are basically unkillable. It is quite insane. And they eat 70 kilograms of polluted dirt or rock pile to excrete 35 kilograms of sand per cycle. And that's where all of our sand is coming from that we talked about earlier. And if you take a look at the egg chances down here, a pinch row egg is at 100%, a oak pinch row can only be obtained if it dwells in ethanol and a sandy pinch row can only be obtained if it dwells in water. They both definitely have their uses but this is not the episode where we go over this. This episode is basically just to get as much lime as we can. Everything that's coming out of here except the sand can be processed into lime and that's what we are after to make as much steel as we can. That is the general idea. But that is all I have for you today. So if you enjoyed the comment, please subscribe to the channel, leave a like on the video and comment down below. You know it, I'm always happy to hear from you. But before I end this episode, one more thing, the links to written tutorials about builds like these here are in the description down below. And with that, I say thank you and peace.